Mr. Benzel, uh, Moderna recently paid NIH $400 million. Do you believe it creates a conflict of interest for the government employees who are making money now off of the vaccine to also be dictating the policy about how many times we have to take the vaccine? Good morning, Senator. Uh, indeed, we recently made, a, before Christmas last year, a $400 million payment to the NIH for uh, an old patent that they had developed, not related to COVID, but useful in the development of a COVID vaccine uh, to, to pay them for their work. Uh, it's for the U.S. government to assess how that money should be Do you think it creates a conflict of interest for the same people deciding the policy of how often we have to take the vaccine to also be making money the more times we take the vaccine? Yes or no? This is for the government to decide. Senator. You have no opinion on whether or not it creates a conflict of interest. Is there a higher interest or a higher incidence of myocarditis among adolescent males 16 to 24 after taking your vaccine? So thank you for the question, Senator. First, let me say we care deeply about safety and we're working closely to, with the CDC and the FDA to Pretty get- Pretty much a yes or no. Is there a higher incidence of myocarditis among boys 16 to 24 after they take your vaccine? The data I've shown actually, I've seen, sorry, from the CDC actually shown that there's less uh, myocarditis for people who get the vaccine versus who get COVID infection. You're, you're saying that for ages 16 to 24 among males who take the COVID vaccine, their risk of myocarditis is less than people who get the disease. That is my understanding. That sir. is not true. And I'd like to enter into the record six peer-reviewed papers from the Journal of Vaccine, the Annals of Medicine that say the complete opposite of what you say. I also spoke with your president just last week and he readily acknowledged in private that yes, there is an increased risk of myocarditis. The fact that you can't say it in public is quite disturbing. Do you think it's scientifically sound to mandate three vaccines for adolescent boys? This is for the public health leaders to decide, Senator. You've been advocating for it. You've been interviewed, and you've been advocating for boosters. Do you know when the myocarditis is most common among these adolescent boys after the second dose? When I spoke with your president, he readily acknowledged in private, yeah, that maybe there ought to be a discussion whether we ought to have one vaccine versus two versus three. If 90% of the myocarditis comes after the second dose, why don't we have a rational discussion about one? Marty McCary, a physician from Johns Hopkins, has said exactly the same thing. It's been discussed, and yet we have this ridiculous notion from the CDC. So the CDC says, and I'll ask you this question. Let's start it as a question. Your 16-year-old's had COVID. Your 16-year-old gets better and now has recovered from COVID. You vaccinate them and they get myocarditis. Are you going to give them two more vaccines? Your child, give them two more vaccines? I'm not a clinician. I will have to discuss. You have children. I do. Have you vaccinated your children? I have. How many times? Three or four times. Three or four times. We so the, the CDC recommends this, and, you know, you're obviously someone who's self-interested in the outcome here, but the CDC says that if your 15, 16-year-old gets COVID, recovers, takes a vaccine and gets myocarditis, is hospitalized with elevated heart enzymes, and is very sick, the CDC says as soon as he gets better, vaccinate him again. You know how many American parents think that that's a rational, reasonable thing to do? Do you know how many countries don't do this for children? Uh, Sweden doesn't offer the vaccine for kids under 12 unless they're at risk for severe disease. And I agree with that. I'm not saying never on any of this. I think it's a very reasonable position to say kids at risk or have some diseases that there may be a reason for vaccinating some children. Finland doesn't recommend it for under 12 months. Norway also. England as well. France, Poland, Germany, Switzerland, and all vaccinate 12 and up. So we got half the world who have looked at these studies. There's a study in Israel of thousands of patients, and yet you sit here and act as if you've never heard of myocarditis, and you don't think it's an increased risk for young adolescent males, when all of the studies who isolate out people by age have found that, yes, there's an increased risk after taking your vaccine. Pfizer, too, but worse with Moderna. 
there's an increased risk than that. I was comparing it to somebody who gets COVID. Well, that's also not true either, but there's an increased risk of getting it. But even when they compare it to the disease, there are many papers out there who do, that do show that there's more of a risk of myocarditis after vaccination. So you have to weigh the risk and balances. And you are right, you're going to make less money because you're going to try, and they're already trying, the CDC's got it on their schedule. They're going to try to force all the kids in America to do this through school. But guess what? Parents aren't going to do it. They've seen that COVID is not deadly in children. And you're right, it's become less deadly over time. Your market's going down. So you aren't going to make as much money. I'm all for you making money in an honest way, but I don't like the idea that the people making the decisions in government are also receiving money and are now conflicted in their interest. Thank you, Senator Paul. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much, Mr. Bensell. Great to be with you, and thanks for your testimony. <clears throat> I wanted to, to get right to the heart of the matter that we're exploring today, among other issues, and that's the question of price. But I wanted to start with a, by way of a predicate that, that we're certainly grateful for the work of Moderna and the other companies working in concert with the federal government, both federal appropriations as well as agencies like NIH and others, to develop these vaccines in short order and to be able to provide the benefit, as you outlined in your testimony, to save millions of lives. And we're grateful for that. We're also grateful for the ongoing work that, that is done every day to, to save lives. I wanted to um, explore, though, this question of this partnership between not only Moder Moderna, but other uh, entities and the federal government. You might call it a public-private partnership. I would argue that that partnership, which yielded such great benefits for our country and the world, should not be extinguished because the pandemic is over. Uh, I would argue there are ongoing uh, obligations and I think even practical reasons to continue uh, that kind of partnership, maybe in a different form, maybe with different outcomes and different dynamics, if you, as you've outlined on page nine of your testimony when you go from um, the, the ver earlier version of a partnership to commercial uh, application of, of, uh, of the vaccine. But I'd ask you this, and I, I noted in your testimony on page one, you said in the second paragraph about um, the Jesuit teachings. I went to a Jesuit high school and college, so I'm somewhat familiar with these, these teachings. You said, quote, Jesuit values, the continuous pursuit of excellence, service of the greater good, number two, and, f and third, social responsibility, you say have informed my life and leadership of Moderna, unquote. So I want to juxtapose uh, those values, which I think are, are commendable, and I, I, I think they're, we hope they're American values as well, uh, next to this, what I would argue is an ongoing obligation to have this partnership. Shouldn't there be a, a, an ongoing obligation with regard to a product that was developed in partnership with the, the federal government to ensure that it remains both inexpensive and accessible. Don't you believe that that is your obligation and Moderna's obligation? Thank you, Senator, and good morning. So first, thank you for the kind words that you shared about our teams and all the other companies and the government uh, personnel who has helped fight this pandemic. So first on access, uh, as I shared in my testimony and in a written one, we care deeply about access and we're working hard with our team and I'm happy to spend more time on that topic. I know it's important for the chairman as well to make sure that people that are uninsured or underinsured have access to a vaccine. We want to make sure that cost and, and out of pocket cash is not a barrier to access to vaccine. Then on the topic of, of price, uh, it's important as we move into the endemic market that we price to value of a vaccine. What value does it bring in terms of healthcare uh, dollars? As you know, vaccines are one of the best investments we can make with healthcare dollars in terms of a return. This has been documented for many, many years because it's better to prevent disease than to have to pay the cost of somebody being hospitalized uh, and that's very expensive cost without even adding the economic burden, obviously. So that's really important. If you look at the interesting comparator is flu. The CVS price of a high dose flu vaccine used for the elderly is around $95 in this country. If you look at COVID, there are two to three times more hospitalization right now of COVID. So when you look at the price in that range, 
seems to make sense versus the value that have been assigned already to flu over the years. And you can look at other vaccines like pneumonia. The, 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 the CVS price of a pneumonia vaccine is around $250. Well, I'd, I'd ask you this, just by way of follow-up, and I realize that you're, you're making that comparison with, with flu vaccine, but for a lot of my constituents, most of my constituents, no matter what their insurance status is, uh, the cost of prescription drugs is like a bag of rocks on their shoulder every single day. Mm -hmm. And what may not seem like a lot of money to you or a lot of other people, $130, $150, or whatever the number ends up, uh, is a lot of money. And I'd ask you, and I'll, I'll ask you for the, the record in, in, in writing, to ensure that anyone can get a vaccine, they won't have to apply through some tedious process and, and then wait for approval. And, or apply for some kind of reimbursement or have to drive a, a long distance. That, I believe, is your obligation as a company. And I know I'm out of time, but we'll ask that in writing. Thank you. Now you can answer that, uh, Mr. Mansell, if you'd like. Yes, and I'm happy to spend time later on, on the topic on the access program. We want to make sure we have a simple program that is in multi-language. We're also trying to learn from what is not working from current programs done by larger companies. So, for example, we want to make sure we can partner with rural community hospital, potentially homeless shelters, to make it much easier. So I'm happy to spend more time on that topic. It's Thank very you. important. Senator Cassidy. Yeah. Yes, I will allow Senator Romney to go next. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I am one of those um, uh, Americans who's concerned about the fact that Americans tend to pay a lot more for drugs than do people in other countries. Uh, and have looked for ways to see if we couldn't uh, have some kind of uh, global um, uh, recognition of the prices that are available in other countries and limiting our, our drug prices to those that may uh, be consistent with a basket of other countries that purchase and honor our, uh, our patents. Um, that being said, um, I, I, uh, I, I reject the idea of, a, if you will, an ex post facto effort on the part of some to say, oh, uh, we, we provided some money in research, a lot of money in research to Moderna, and therefore, we want to take the ownership of this product. Uh, that that would simply uh, be unfair and contrary to our uh, our system of, of law. Um, I would also note that the U.S. investment in Moderna's uh, effort, uh, I, I would comprise a portion that went to research and 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 fast tracking the. Uh, the vaccine versus actually purchasing vaccine that was being manufactured by Moderna. Uh, the latter was the great bulk of what the United States government invested, if you will, uh, and actually the wrong word is invested. We purchased a lot of product from Moderna, glad we did. Um, I'd also note this, which is this is a, a, a global uh, uh, demonstration the world can look at as to the comparison between socialism and capitalism. Free enterprise created vaccines that saved millions of lives. And, and the history of Moderna, I think, is pretty interesting. Uh, you indicated the company started 10 years before COVID, 10 years. It had no products during that time, no, no revenues at all. The investment you said, if I got it right, was $3.8 billion. So that meant individuals responsible for investing money put $3.8 billion into a new technology that might or might not work. I recall uh, understanding that at one point you indicated to your family that you thought there was a 5% chance it would work, yeah. this technology would work. So if I'm an investor putting $3.8 billion in an enterprise that has a 5% chance of working, I got to expect that if it does work, I'm going to make an awful lot of money. Now, I've heard people say, well, that's corporate greed. Yeah, that's kind of how the free enterprise system works, which is... People who start enterprises say, I'm going to take a huge risk, invest my life savings, my career, and if it works, I get a huge return. If it doesn't, I lose it all. There are right now in our country hundreds of startup businesses with trying to develop drugs that will cure diseases. I happen to know that because I invested in some in my prior life. I lost my money in every single one. Studied them as well as we could. We lost our money. That's the nature of it. But we thought if it works we're going to really get a huge return for ourselves and for our investors. So, uh, you know, I don't know how much money is the right amount of money, but the idea that somehow corporate greed has just been invented in America is absurd. It's been there for the beginning of free enterprise, individuals investing, hoping that if it succeeds, they'll do very well financially, extraordinarily well. So I want to applaud the example we have. By the way, the socialist countries, 
China and Russia and, and Northern Europe, did they come up with a vaccine that, that, that saved lives? No. No, they didn't. Uh, Pfizer got uh, technology from a German company, free enterprise company, Moderna, and saved lives. It is a stark demonstration of the comparison between free enterprise and socialism. And free enterprise works, and socialism doesn't when it comes to saving our lives. Now, um, I, I, uh, I, I look at the technology which you're uh, proposing to continue to develop in, in other areas, and I guess I, I want to ask, um, what are the kinds of things that you're working on now? What are the prospects that you believe for some of these to, to make a real difference in saving lives or improving lives? Is this a one-off technology? Uh, mRNA, is this something which is really just effective for vaccines or does it have broader application? And, and what will you do with the, with the money that the company is making? By the way, I, I noted that you're a billionaire now. Did, did the company pay you a salary of billions of dollars? Uh, no, no, sir, that's all. Uh, you're a billionaire because the stock that you got when you started the company, you kept some of it, I presume. Mm -hmm. That stock is now worth a lot of money because your technology has been proven to actually work. Is it going to work beyond vaccines? And what kinds of things are you working on? So thank you, Senator. So we're very excited because this is a platform that we worked on for 10 years. Uh, we shared just before Christmas exciting data in cancer, which we are very excited because, of course, all of us have been touched or are being touched right now by cancer. And we show 44% reduction in recurrence of disease for melanoma cancer or deaths. Uh, we are working very quickly to get this with the FDA in a phase three study this year. Uh, we're also working with our partners at Merck to try this into the lung. And we're gonna want to explore as many tumor types as we can to see where can we help people. Because if, we, if that result translates to other tumor type, which we believe should happen, we have to be careful and, of course, wait for the clinical data. That could help a lot of people. We're also working on rare genetic disease. One of the reasons I got excited about Moderna in the early days is, you know, I have children. And, I, I'm and sorry. I, uh, uh, Senator Romney's speech on socialism took up the bulk of the time. Uh, we have to go to Senator Murray right now. As did.